And off we go with the next one then, and what a lovely sound this is as well. Straight out of our uh, Fun 30, beautiful record from Blue Mink. It's called Melting Pot. And, as one cannibal said to another... Did you want me? Mixed with yellow chinkies. Ah, oh, we try harder. Yes, we do. If you lump it all together... Can you tell me what you got, baby? Well, you got a recipe for a little long scene. Oh, what a beautiful dream. If Here we go! Come, come on, come on, come on! What we need is a great big melting pot. When Auntie BBC put on a caftan and beads and entered the pop age, Roscoe, a former pirate, hurled himself into the forefront of the wonderful world of Radio 1. He set a new style for a new breed, disc jockeys, the DJs. <laughs> They're not just the pop princes of the transistor kingdom, but also the theatrical bouncing presenters who work in ballrooms, discotheques and even pubs, the frontmen of a very, very commercial industry. In America, top DJs are superstars themselves, on a par with the pop idols they promote. This is Dojo Weekly Display. This is Mark Brady wishing you a very good evening. Welcome once again to the top-ranked Croydon Suite. They're not yet in the same league in this country, but Radio 1's little bands still form an exclusive elite, envied by their less publicised colleagues in the provinces. Pop music is big business. There are about 70 new records released every week. If a DJ doesn't like a record enough to play it, the public don't hear it and won't buy it. But DJs like Roscoe are more than just powerful figures in the beat music industry. Exposure to millions of listeners brings them celebrity status. You've been waiting long enough. Roscoe came from a Californian DJ school, Radio Luxembourg, and a pirate ship. His real name is Mike Pasternak, the son of the Hollywood producer of those syrupy Diana Durbin films. Radio One belongs to the taxpayer and doesn't splash princely salaries around for men like Emperor Roscoe. He accepts the BBC's sharp policy of paying low wages because both sides know about the big, big perks that can accompany the adulation from the subjects of this new empire, the British teeny boppers. Listening to his voice, and you know, I get carried away now. <laughs> what do you mean you get carried away? Well, I just hear his voice, and I just imagine him, you know, and it's really great when you put it together, like. When you say you imagine him, you imagine him doing what? <laughs> talking well, to you? Talking and smiling, and all his actions with it, you know, it's just good. <laughs> and where do you usually listen to this? Um, in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> An award usually marks achievement. One of the old men of the business, Pete Murray, recently got an OBE. But Roscoe's fans believe just being Roscoe is a feat that deserves a trophy in itself. Half of the Roscoe range is a great brick. I'd like to present you with this award as a token of our appreciation for you for the last year. That's beautiful. Thank you very, very much, all of you, and especially, especially one, of the, one of the groovy rangers here. <laughs> No, it isn't that well-known commercial. Well, the time is half past five. You're listening to the BBC, to radios one and two. It's just that there's no time for the traditional British breakfast, for the boy who at 27 has become as much a part of breakfast time as bacon and eggs. Tony Blackburn, a doctor's son, went to Britain's most expensive public school, Millfield, then a course in business studies, three years as a singer with a dance band, a stint in pirate radio, before becoming, as he proudly calls himself, the Mary Poppins of Radio One. He doesn't smoke, seldom drinks, votes conservative, and after every show phones his mother in Bournemouth. The running order is planned by the producer after consulting Tony, 
but he's the only DJ on Radio 1 who doesn't have a producer at his elbow during the programme. The show is unscripted, although his grown jokes are written down in red exercise books, which he keeps handy. Ladies. Morning. 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 In a couple of minutes, you'll be heard by millions of people right throughout the country. I hope. What are you trying to bring them? Um. Just sort of, uh, an atmosphere more than anything else. Whoops, put that down a little bit. Um, an atmosphere more than anything else. I think a, a sort of a fun sound. I like to think of it as fun radio. In other words, a lot of people wake up in the morning feeling absolutely terrible. And uh, I like to make them feel just a little bit happy before they go to work. This is the, really the idea of the thing. Right. Henry Bryan and his quartet and Monon bringing us to the parting of the ways on radios one and two. Time now, exactly seven o'clock. He handles the cassettes of prepared material, the confusion of controls, turntables and telephones, as happily as a little boy playing with a McCarney set. Up to the minute Motoring reports, time checks, but now more music on the Tony Blackburn show. It's a blast! <laughs> Welcome once again to the fun, frill, frivolous, frolicking world of fun. Well, that's what it says here at any rate. <laughs> Welcome along to the Tony Blackburn Show this morning for this Tuesday the 9th of December. My thanks as always to John Dunn for swinging us up uh, until the 7 o'clock hour. And I hope very sincerely everyone that uh, you're feeling fit and well this morning and that you're going to enjoy the show right the way through till 9. And as one astronaut said to another... The world is just a great... Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell to sing. And hey, that fear of the spices that made me fly. Karl Marx said religion is the opium of the people. So by the same token, could pop be called the modern worker's opiate? Anyway, this tube-fed congregation think that Radio 1 is not only wonderful, but necessary. Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, they're number 17 this week, and that's called The Onion Song. Hey, hey, four and a quarter minutes now, past seven o'clock, and I was just thinking to myself, if suddenly a hen started producing bricks, I suppose they'd be called a bricklayer. Well, you know, he's grown, it's his jokes and things, which you feel so, you laugh afterwards, and it makes you feel so, it wakes you up. It's the Jimmy Young Show. Radio 1 blasts the airwaves from two electronic cubby holes, produced about as cheaply as radio can be. It's a bright, brash upstart of a channel aimed at youth, yet its most celebrated son is a 48-year-old vintage pop star who peddles unfashionably corny cheerfulness and sugary sentiments. Nearly 20 years ago, Jimmy Young became famous when he sang They Tried to Tell Us We're Too Young. Today, seven okay. and a half million housewives don't feel he's too old when he gives them recipes and time checks and has happy telephone conversations with them. His career is shot up and down, and it's made him a lonely man, very concerned with money and the security it may give him. But there's no insecurity about his performance. His technique is skillful, his timing precise. How much preparation do you put into the show? Well. Um, in terms of this morning, not a lot. More than for an all-record show, because two-thirds of this show is not, in fact, on record, and I therefore have to, what is uh, in the trade, known as top-and-tail tapes to hear what's going on. Because until I come in, I don't know what music's in the show. 
Um, but so there's more preparation on the day than there would be for an all record show. But most of the preparation is done uh, the previous week in terms of sorting cards and uh, this sort of thing. Who chooses the music then? Doreen Davis, who's executive producer on the show. This is an arrangement that we, we had right from the start, whereby, as far as I'm concerned, this is a, uh, a personality type show uh, in which I establish contact with the people at home uh, and Doreen supplies the music. But does it reflect your own taste in music? Uh, well, generally, of course, it does, because, in other words, what we really did, I mean, as in running any business, you set a policy, and once you've set the policy, it runs itself. And when it doesn't run itself, you change it. Do you listen to much music when you're away from the studio? Not a great deal, and if you listen to two hours every morning, neither would you. <laughs> Morning all, and uh, very warm Wednesday type uh, welcomes to one and all, definitely outside a little touch of the TTT. It's turned uh, terribly tatered. Well, 2510 ideally into sky, but it doesn't matter, you know. Some people feel that he's perhaps a little over cheerful. Does this worry you? No, 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 it don't, no. I'm always leaping around myself and that, so it doesn't make much difference. When you say always leaping around, do you dance to his music that he plays? <laughs> well, I have a jig. <laughs> Coming up. Oh! It's a test of my expertise, isn't it? Ah, yes, Jam Up and Jelly Tight there by Tommy Rowe. My goodness, we nearly missed that one, you see, because there I was having a little... Well, I was chatting away to myself when what I should actually have been doing is pressing this little button. Oh, I'm gonna have me some. Oh, I'm telling you the quiet life, quite the life for me. You tell them, Raymondo. Oi, what's the recipe today, Dick? Ah, thought you'd never ask. Apricot and meat pie, isn't it? A dish fit for the British housewife, maybe, but hardly for an emperor, even if a self-styled one. Roscoe, flash, brash, easy riding to the top. Right about now you find me on the highway. Pointing my thumb at all the cars going my way. Round about here you'll see me get a little weary. I got no one left to keep me warm and cheery. The thought of coming home keeps me going. Well, how about giving the wife a nice kiss? We're going to put the Radio 1 kissing turn on now. And you know the idea of this. You can kiss absolutely anybody you like. There might be, you might be at work at the moment, and there might be that very attractive blonde there sitting over in the corner. Well, if you go out to her and kiss her, then while the kissing turns on, she can't slap your face or anything, so don't you dare worry about that, all right? Or there might be a girl by the bus stop, well, um, that you, you rather fancy, so you can just pull into the side there and give her a nice kiss while the turn is on, OK? So you ready? OK, stand by for it. Off we go, then. Here it comes. Come here, Granny. Oh. Lovely. <laughs> That's a there you go, then. Marvellous. Oh. She's supposed to break in and say, what about me, you see? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Come in and say, you see? Hey, hey, stop. Well, that, that's finished. One that's... for birthday, one for Christmas, one for what Santa's going to bring you, one for what Santa Claus is going to bring you. I said stop, all right. One for what going Roscoe's going to give you. Aren't you? One for what Roscoe's not going to give you. One... <laughs> Doesn't your kiss and cuddle spot offend some people? Not the people who are doing it. <laughs> no, um, I don't think so. I think it's just all a bit of fun. I know people do, and when, when we do the bedroom twisting session in, in uh, about 7.15, I ask them to open up the windows and say, Radio 1 is wonderful, and people do actually do that. And we've had one or two people who've uh, sort of dislocated their ankles twisting in the bath, or dancing in the bath, but uh, 
I don't think people really take it that seriously. It's just meant for a bit of a joke. It's really what you conjure up in your own imagination. This is the joy of radio, of course. Radio plays, you know, it's what you conjure up in your own mind, and you haven't got it there as in television with pictures. So it's perhaps the suggestion that people are all kissing and cuddling each other just for the split second while this ridiculous tone thing is going on. I say, excitement reigns intense. 30 seconds to 11 o'clock, parting of the ways for radios one and two. So don't forget, if you want to stay with your own personal morning show, uh, for your personal postcards and the telephone and swinging music. Tiny touch of the swinging music. 247 meters, that's where you want to be. Radio one, 247, where the JY show will be leaping away all the way. TTT through till 12. To many, Jimmy Young may be a square peg in a square hole but his fans have made him Radio 1's most highly paid DJ and the only one to have his own post room in the BBC. Irene Cook, part secretary, part disciple, believes that Jimmy Young plays an important part in the lives of British housewives. You're in charge of Jimmy Young's post room. How many letters and postcards do you get every day? Um, every day, roughly four to five hundred. What do you feel they gain? I think the warmth of his personality makes them feel that he is really talking to them, uh, mentioning their name, and uh, just the odd little bit of chat, you know? And this warms them through and through. I, I can only believe that, because they say they have felt, uh, you know, somehow so bright and uh, everything has been so easy for the rest of the day. I can't quite pretend to get into that sort of mentality, but they're perfectly sincere about it. People think that uh, Jimmy Young and people like this should be taken off the radio and sort of burnt at the stake and all kinds of things like that, which I think is wrong, because obviously people like Jimmy Young and uh, enjoy what he does, and his programme's aimed at housewives. John Peel, the stormy petrel of Radio One, who infuriated Harold Wilson when the government's Biafra policy was criticised on his programme. He shocked listeners too by admitting he'd suffered from VD and discussing the beauty of women's nipples. He joined Radio 1 and soon became the Pop Underground's champion. On his show, he's as likely to play a Korean Buddhist chant as the Beatles' latest. If you listen to Radio 1 for an entire week, or a year even, you won't hear anything at all that relates to anything that's going on. You know, it's, it's just all this incredibly predictable sort of porridge, really. Um, just meaningless stuff. And I think it would be better if it related to things that were going on, if it was more immediate, because this is where radio scores over the other media, in that it can be immediate, it can be right there, you know, it's what's actually going on, what's happening. And it should be much more flexible than it is, because now you can turn on the radio at any given time. And you know exactly what's going to come out of it, you know. It's just, hi, great to be with you this morning. We've got some knockout sounds, or whatever happened, time of day it is, you know. And uh, you don't learn anything at all from listening to it for an entire week. And the music, of course, is basically, I think, uh, pretty dismal. Radio One excites! But John Peel's views don't prevent him taking home his £40 a week salary from the man in charge, Douglas Muggeridge who, like Peel, was educated at Shrewsbury, but unlike Peel, didn't start pop life as a pirate, but came from the ranks of the overseas service, when last year, at the age of 40, he was appointed controller of Radios 1 and 2. He has strong ideas about communications, but Radio 1 has been criticised for churning out soporific rubbish. Well, Radio 1 is just like pop. It's fun. It's entertainment. After all, one of the whole motives behind the new plans for radio is to offer alternatives. Um, news and current affairs of serious music, of, of light music, popular music, pop, right across the strata. And I mean, one mustn't look upon Radio One as something which is so terribly serious. So Kenny Everett is the enfant terrible of Radio One, a sort of DJ Spike Milligan. Hey, I went to see the Director General the other day. You did, sir. Oh, yes. Very good friend of mine, the old Durgen, you know. Yes, we have tea together. 
and you should see the pad he's in. Oh, my God, I entered trembling footsteps. What a place. Oh, talk about marble holes. Oh, what a pad, man. And then suddenly, I was stopped in my tracks by the voice. Stop. This is the voice of Muglas Duggeridge, the great king of the wireless waves, whose word is law and whose voice puts fear in all that hear it. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't go there too often. <laughs> lives in a basement flat with a Great Dane called Bozy, Smoky his parrot, Snuffy his cat, a chihuahua known as Bo Bells, and his wife Audrey. The 24-year-old son of a Mersey Tugman, he's been called the first genius of Radio 1 by Robin Scott, the original boss and founder. Yet he's been hauled over the coals by Auntie's top brass for publicly pushing the cause of commercial radio. Instead of being sacked, he's wound up with a two-hour show at peak time. disc jockey you get written about in the highbrow magazines and the intellectual newspapers why do you think this is i've been in the listener twice you know a listener <laughs> i don't know I, um it's not so uh it's not so wild as the other programs i think it's not as wild and hairy as roscoe and the old folks can't quite keep up with that nor do they want to and it's not as quite as uh, as that was this is as, as the other programs, there's, there's, there's something of interest for everybody, I think, even if it's only one thing of interest in the whole program, because we, we do so many different things um, on the show. So there's bound to be one thing. I, I mean, even the director general has told me a few bits that in the program that he's liked. So I've actually spoken, he's a nice old man, you know. Nice old man. These 45 pounds a week, though. Oh, they are. These days, so many people take pop seriously. Sociologists analyze it. Uh, writers in intellectual papers write yeah. about it. Well, where yeah. do you see pop in our culture? Oh, is it in our culture? Culture? I don't know. I, I wouldn't say it was. No, it's, it's too trite to be that. Pop records, they come and go very, very fast. I don't think they, they deserve a place in, 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 cult, in the culture bracket. No, it, it's too trite a business even to talk about, and here we are talking about it. <laughs> Still, it's in colour. Hey, Liddy, it's a good place to cut. So you don't feel you've got any influence at all, your programme as such? You don't think it influences our society at all? No, I don't think so at all. Unless I say something definite that I've, I've probably read in the papers and I, I do give a comment about, but that probably only affects people about one third <coughs> of a point of a percent. I don't think it has that effect. I think it just sort of... Um, lifts the atmosphere a bit, about 5% of people listening. I mean, if somebody's washing the dishes listening, uh, not listening, they would feel 20% happy or whatever. And if they switched the radio on and heard it, they'd feel 25% happy, just a bit. It just lifts the atmosphere of fun a little. And this is what you try and do? Yeah, that's all you can do with radio, really. You can't, you can't inform on radio because it, it's, a, it's a frilly channel, it's a silly channel. If you want to inform in this Radio 2, which is the greatest radio service in the world, folks. I've been to America and they have lots of silly channels there. They're all better than our silly channel, but they don't have any serious good channel that does woman's hour and plays and things. How they are they better? better? How are they better? What, they're commercial channels? Yeah. Uh, they bubble brighter than ours. I think that's... It, you can only talk about it in atmospheres, because it's not a solid thing. It's not the 
uh, Joe Blow on WXYZ is better than, than Tony Blackburn or, or Tony Blackburn is better than somebody else. It's, um, you can only talk about in atmospheres and their stations are 20% bubblier than ours is. I don't know what we can do about it. You mentioned woman's hour. Do you like woman's hour? Oh, I love it. Love woman's hour? Why? I don't know. Just something about woman's hour that just sort of gets me, you know? <laughs> Seriously, though, folks. Uh, it's a great program. It's got lots of different articles in it, and serious people go on there and chat about things like um, writers and things. But do you think in 10 years' time, maybe in 20 years' time, it'll still be you and Jimmy Young and Roscoe? If we haven't killed each other. <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. I, I'll, I'll definitely give up. Before, before I crack. <laughs> I don't think we can keep going that long. Uh, people would, I think, would put up with us, but I don't think we could last out because it's such a, it's a silly job when you think about it deeply and you can't go around not thinking deeply all your life. When you really think about it, you think, oh, why aren't I doing something really useful, like building hospitals or at least playing a musical instrument or something? And after a while, you, you just get depressed about it. That's why I do so many bits in my program. I do so many prepared things so that to stave off the feeling that I'm parasiting on the medium, you know. I like to feel as I'm actually taking part in it instead of just playing records. Uh, oh, oh, hell in there. Oh, well, to work. The state they leave this studio in is just disgusting. Right. Hello. And welcome. This is where it's all done, you see. This is the, uh, the radio studio that the DJs have built. Tape recorders, there are panel here, tea, coffee, sugar, and gramophones. And uh, this is where I come alive. I'm a drag outside the building, but in here, the whole world is my oyster. Today, the BBC. Tomorrow, ITV, if they love me. Excuse me, sir. Basement bill here. I just want to know if you want any revival. Revives? Because <laughs> I'm going down to the basement in amongst the filth and the muck to dig you some out. Right, right. Oh, oh it's me gammy leg, you know. Uh... Sir? Yes, what is Basement it? Basement Billy, I know. I yes. just wish to know if yeah. you want any revival. Revives? Why? Because I'm going down to the basement. Oh, in good. amongst the filth and the muck. Oh. To dig you some out. Oh, good. Right? Right. right. What a oh, mess you are. Oh, it's me gammy legs. Is it? Oh. Two days it takes, you know, to get that lot together. One show, two hours, two days in here. <gasps> is it worth it? I ask myself. Mm, must be. I wouldn't be doing it. Turn on the radio every day, how simply wonderful. Hooray, 247 is where you'll see music and laughter, BBC. So when you're not feeling awfully low, here's what to do to make your blues just go. Open the pages of your radio times and turn on the radio and groove your blues away. Crisp the butler, played by actor Brian Colvin, is the only character in the show not played by Kenny. Basement Bill and Granny, a 120-year-old nymphomaniac, are only two of the inhabitants in the world Kenny has created. I like to play on the record machine all the popular records that there might have been in the past so that I can go on to the radio and play them as more the oldies days. <laughs> Auntie know another world. Almost every night of every week, somewhere in London, a record company has a reception. The most sought-after guests are the disc jockeys. They're the link between the music industry and the public. It's where the commercial pressures begin. There's money in it for everyone. The music business is big business, and like most businesses, it's an in-world. During the endless round of parties, DJs meet the same people and talk about the same subject, the rich, rich world of pop. 
Thank you very much. You must have influence, Thank actually. You. I'm going to drink. Oh, well. You definitely. Mm. Oh, that's very kind of you. It's typical, isn't it? The ice. <laughs> no, no. That's good stuff in there. Milk. What's that? really just just in the evening that's about all who are your friends Tony are they the people inside the industry uh, I don't re I don't really have many uh, uh, many close friends basically my friends are the, the people I work with the whole time um, really just people within my agency who are immensely nice people and uh, these are really the people I, I mix with I have a girlfriend as well <laughs> who's a bunny uh, but apart from that really I, I just um, I, I'm a great believer in not having too many friends, particularly within the industry that you're um, sort of connected with. I believe in um, in going in and doing your work and not mixing too much with people who you are involved in, because I think uh, quite often if you mix socially with people who you're working with, you tend to have different ideas, whether it's broadcasting or uh, anything else, you have different ideas and you might upset people. And therefore it's best to not upset uh, too many people. Therefore, the fewer people you talk to, the fewer people you're likely to upset. Therefore, I stick to myself, mainly. A disc jockey's post bag is always heavy. They're bombarded with records and promotion material. The persuasion is fierce and constant. Cold enough for snow. Very cold enough for snow. Good morning. I didn't want to drop them in a box. Oh, lovely. Payola, bribing DJs to promote records, a frequent scandal in America, has never reached sinister proportions here. But there are people called record pluggers, like this girl, snooping round the BBC. There's at least ten to every disc jockey and broadcasting house. One of the best known, who prefers to be called a record promoter, is Dave Most. So I walk in, if they say yes, got a hit record. Mm -hmm. That's the first line I say. If it's really wrong, I should open the conversation slowly and gently then say, but I can't help it, I get so excited over something, and I believe in it, I have to play it. But they know that enthusiasm. And I think that's what they perhaps like about it, you know. And if it's uh, for them, they'll play it. And I put it on and I say, it's a smash, isn't it? Sometimes they say, and then I have to work at it. And then I'll work and I'll say to them, look, I'll even sing over parts if I think it's going to sell the records, you know, which obviously kills the record when I start singing, but they laugh. But, and I may swing them on it, you know, you never know. It, that little balance of power where they need to have one record in that programme that's going to sell your records on Saturday morning or Sunday afternoons or whenever you want, you know. Uh, that one time I slipped in there and hustled a little bit more, I may get the play and make the record a hit. Is it true that people like um, Tony Black can, can make and break people's careers in the music industry? Um, oh yeah. If, if they don't go on a record, that artist can die, just like that. But that's tough, that's just life, isn't it? Everywhere a DJ goes, there's a plugger close behind him, treading on his tail. This is Jenny, Hello. most beautiful plugger. Oh, you're not, no, uh, you wouldn't. I would. No, you Office wouldn't. is just around the corner, yes. and I saw your car. Yeah. 
so I couldn't resist this opportunity. No way. Uh, I've got, no way. Uh, I've got fantastic. Yeah, I heard that, but you know, it's it's like almost halfway banned, I think. Well, it's not halfway it banned. They're all saying it. Do you mean Yeah, saying but it? Think, think of the people that are not religious. Well, you they know. won't like it. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, Jenny, you can ask me for anything in the world except a record. Yeah. Oh, come on. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll raffle it off. In, in no, no, I don't want you to raffle it. I want you to listen to it. I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it on the telly, you know. Listen They've got all kinds of letters of protest in the newspapers the next yeah. day. Yeah, but see... Tell you what I'll do. What? I'll let you, I'll let you talk me into it with a, with, with a cup of tea. No, no. Now, can I... Don't do you agree? Don't you, shouldn't you, know? you talk yeah. me into it? You should all right. 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 Let's go. A cup of tea. In you go. Cliff, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. All right. No, I certainly I suggest you hang on. The record being plugged is Superstar, which came near to being banned for crossing the boundaries of good taste. This is rather a funny postcard, actually. It was a letter, really. And it comes from Irene Newman of number 80, Gravel Hill, Addington, Croydon, you see. And she says, Dear Jim, you are a very foolish man, she said. If you buy yourself some vitamin C tablets, she said, they're called blah, 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 and you can buy them at blah, blah, blah. She said, you will never, ever be laid low with a bad chest again. She says, my husband, myself, and uh, my 13-year-old son, we take one every morning all the year round, and we never catch cold, and we've thrown off guitar and sore throats. Please, Jim, do yourself a favour and stay young with vitamin C, she says. Point is, you see, Irene, I already take it, and I still got a grotty chest. So what do I do now, I ask myself. I'll tell you, I'll play Superstar. Jesus Christ, Like all superstars, Tony's every word is avidly sought by ladies like Julie Webb, reporting for Rave magazine. How do you go about set chatting up a girl? Have you got a set line of chat? Uh, yeah, I'm the world's worst chatter up, as you know. You know, I just sort of, I just w wait for somebody to come and talk to me usually. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe that. Myself, no. um, I, what, what sort of girls do you like? Sort of girls like, um, like you, sort of long blonde hair. Oh yeah. Yes, Patisse, like you. Um, Fat girls, skin girls. Fairly. It doesn't really bother me, actually, but it's moderately thin, like you. In actual fact, you're my perfect oh, yes. example. Oh, Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I chat up girls, see? Just like Just, that. Yeah, we just mm. started talking to her, and that's the way it happened, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> like that. Um, where do you take a girl when you're taking her out? Uh, I like to go, oh, well, let me see, anywhere, the theatre, the cinema. Uh, but I think, first of all, to out to dinner or something like that, because then you, can, then you can chat to somebody, can't you? Mm. Otherwise, if you go to a theatre or a cinema, you end up staring at the cinema screen. You never actually... So we'll say hello to anybody else. Meanwhile, on behalf of Rod Bill Crozier and Ed Dorian Davis, this is Jimmy Young saying BFN. Bye for now. <laughs>I only ever wanted to be in showbiz. When I was a little boy, if people asked me what I wanted to do, I said sing. I mean, automatically. It's all I've ever wanted to do. I've always wanted to be in this business, and I've never really wanted to do anything else. Uh, and I've been in the business a long time, and finally have got a sort of slot in which this is a round peg in a round hole, which doesn't happen very often. You know, you, you go through this business doing a lot of things. Uh, some of them you do well, some of them you do badly, but only ever, ever occasionally do you manage to get yourself in a position where pretty well all the factors are just about right. Doesn't happen very often. You have had a career that's fluctuated very much. Wildly, yeah. At the moment you're right up there at the top. Yeah. Where do you go from here? Oh, right down the bottom again, I see. Um, you know, life is like that, isn't it? I, um, one hopes, you know, not to fluctuate too much, but surely this is part of the thing that makes you a good performer if you're a good performer. In fact, it's, it's very difficult to be a first-rate performer without experience, and experience means hard knocks because those are the things uh, which teach you humility uh, and they teach you to remember your place and they teach you never to be too big for your boots and never to get bigger than the job and remember what it's all about. Roscoe designed a crest for himself, 
which looked too close to the real thing for some people up top who got uptight about it. And now the Emperor's announced that he isn't an Emperor anymore, just I plain Roscoe. No, a glass of water for the Emperor! <laughs> oh, you... Like that. <laughs> All gone. One more? It's not so long ago that it was obligatory for BBC announcers to wear dinner jackets when at work. You know, a man could get electrocuted like that. Roscoe, no one can but be impressed by your energy and your performance. But really, is it necessary? I mean, wouldn't listeners be just as pleased to listen to records? What really is your role? I don't know. I didn't even hear the question. Yeah. Well, you're a disc <laughs> jockey. You call yourself emperor. You surround yourself by this entourage. You don't read you have the press. You don't read the press, young lady. I don't call myself emperor anymore. But you called yourself emperor this morning. No, you thought I did. See, it's power of suggestion. Now, People have heard emperor office. for so long that... Uh, let me just put him away, okay? But aren't you just a guy who plays records? <laughs> no, no, it's all a constructive thing. You see, you can, anybody can play records. I do that on Radio 3 all day. You know, or when they can, needle-wise. But I think people like to have um, a little something uh, to kind of distract them at times. Because otherwise, it's kind of boring just hearing records all the time. A lot of stations in the States have failed because all they had, they just put records and records and records. Whereas personality is kind of foobie sometimes. Oh, it's considerably tidy studio than you had yes. last week. Oh, well, I had a bit of time to clean it up afterwards for once, you see. Yeah, it looks almost habitable. Looked as though you had a wedding in here last week. Yeah, well, I told you that was that box, the apple, the apple mm. people said. And then, oh, a bunch of little things in it. Oh, the furniture's gone. Right, that's all right. I was going to leave you a pogo stick, but... <laughs> a real one? Yeah. Oh, very good. Came I used to have one of those. Came ones. in the mail yeah. today. A full... Yeah, size the thing is, I think, it, I think it's for kids, because when I tried leaping on it, it, it just sank all the way into the floor. You know, it didn't have enough spring to bounce me back up again. I used to have one of those when I was a, when I was a young lad, back around the turn of the century. <laughs> I'm just on the janitorial staff here, you see, basically oh. what it's all about. You won't find any in there. Seat cloth. Clean ash tray. Right. Okay. Do you want this phone number? Some adoring female, no doubt. Yeah. Anxious. 56063, does that mean anything to you? 56063. 6396. Right. I cannot believe, I simply cannot get used to the idea that people consider. DJs to be pop stars and, and all this kind of thing, because it's ludicrous. I mean, it really is. The comparison I always make uh, is the thing about a book. You know, if you buy a book, you need the numbers on the pages to find your place and find your way through the book. But the numbers on the pages are not the book, and the DJs are not radio. There are an awful lot of them have, unfortunately, become convinced that they are. And so they build up these enormous publicity machines for, for, for nothing, you know, which is very strange indeed. You have a picture of Tony Blackburn up there. Yes, well, uh, well, that's there basically as, as a cautionary tale, I think, because uh, it seems to me, with the best will in the world, that, that Tony has become a victim of this uh, star-building DJ thing. And uh, I think it's very sad, because what appears to have happened, and I may be doing him a, a, a considerable injustice, but what seems to have happened is that you had originally Tony Blackburn, a you know, nice little guy from Bournemouth and stuff, who liked doing jolly radio programs, and uh, was a happy little fella. Eventually, he sort of publicity thing was built up next door to him, uh, and little bits of Tony Blackburn were fed into this machine, you see, into this sort of thing that's built up alongside the real Tony Blackburn. And eventually, for one reason or another, he moved into it completely, you know. So that now, I always get the feeling, and I think he perhaps feels it himself, although he probably wouldn't admit it, that uh, he, he's like a totally created person. You know, sort of, it's jollity and friendliness of the, of the flick of a switch, you know. You often wonder if he goes to the loo. I think there's more glamour to being a disc jockey than to being an actual artist uh, or a, um, a, a singer. I wouldn't like to be a pop singer, because I don't think there's any glamour to it anymore. I think uh, the most unglamorous existence of all is going around travelling with these groups, because this, this is the most unglamorous way of making a living. And I wouldn't like to have to travel around the country, sleeping sort of on the road and all the rest of it. Uh, but being a disc jockey, you've got a certain, there's a lot of prestige to it, and uh, something I enjoy. And of course, disc jockeying, I think, um, 
and talking to the public and being on the air every day, you become a friend to the public. And this is a very, very important part of life now. I think the disc jockey has become a friend to millions of people, and there are a lot of very unhappy people. Basically, the idea is to make a name for yourself and then use that for sort of financial interests outside. And this is what I do. But I'm very interested in the commercial side of uh, things. Because after all, I am basically a product. I, I, I've sort of made the name, and therefore I'm a product to sell. And this is what I do outside, to sell my name, really. Selling the name enables Tony Blackburn to earn £150 a day judging a beauty contest and make £25,000 in a year. Most DJs get only a fraction of their incomes from broadcasting. They use Radio 1 to sell themselves. It may not be a profession recognised by school career masters, but there's a fat living to be made from the exploitation of a BBC image. <laughs> Why did you invite Tony Blackburn to be one of the judges? Well, we felt that with Tony Blackburn, we were getting a personality that represented the modern pop world without necessarily being a pop star as such himself. Um, he was a person, or is a person, that is particularly acceptable to girls, very popular, but equally he's popular among the male fraternity and among mums and dads, and this is very important if you're bringing young girls down to London for a competition. They like to know that they are meeting and uh, dealing with people who are um, very solid, if you like. Hardly any DJ is offered a longer future than a three-month-at-a-time contract by the BBC. It's a deliberate policy. It keeps them on their toes, frightened about their future, and encourages them to look for their security, as well as the big money in the outside world. So Roscoe discovers groups, has become a pop record producer in his own right. Hey, come on! Time is money! That's right! You mean that's right? right My right. money! Oh, Play! Right. Play! Roscoe, uh, important writer in this country, has called you the messiah among disc jockeys. Is this how you see yourself? God bless him, whoever he may be. No, uh, that's a bit strong, actually. I'm the best, the best looking, of course. But um, as far as having talent, I think Tommy Vance is a very groovy disc jockey. But let's just say I have an, an overall presence that's very helpful, especially with a lot of outside appearances and things. But the fact that you're now spreading your interests and um, recording and being a production manager as well, doesn't this mean that you're dissatisfied with your role as a disc jockey? In a way, it could mean that. I would say a lot of it has to do with getting old. I mean, I've reached, I've reached the 25-year the mark in my age now, and, uh, you know, I'm starting to feel a bit like what's going to happen in, the, in another 10 years when I'm no longer the best-looking disc jockey around, you see? The wonderful world of Radio 1 is frequently criticised, not least by those who mourn the death of the pirate ships. It's under fire for falling between two stools, trying to cater to both kids and housewives, and pleasing neither. But it's certainly here to stay, and the DJs are part of this new BBC package, selling not only the goods, but also themselves, as they reach for their idea of the sweet life. What a sweet life! Are DJs really necessary? A lot of people perhaps would be quite happy just to listen to music in the background. Oh, no, I think they're absolutely vital. I mean, they've been described in different ways, haven't they? One extreme is that DJs are to pop rather as fleas to a dog. I mean, that's one attitude. What the do you other, mean by that? Well, I suppose they're that much unnecessary and that much of an irritation to the music. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's the other view that DJs are as important, are more important than the music, and as important as the average pop star. Uh, I think the truth is somewhere uh, nearer that one. Of course they're necessary, woman. What are you trying to say? <laughs> No, I think they are, because I've heard a station in the States once, they were, they're always experimenting over there to get listeners. Like, they play all, like, the top five over and over and over and over again, all week, to try and grab listeners, or they try all news or something. And there's one station that was trying all records without a DJ, because D they thought DJs got in the way of the records, and all people wanted to hear was music. But it, it worked out as a tremendous failure, because people like to hear a voice even if it's a boring one, they like to know that there's somebody human playing the records, and it's not just a machine going like that. They like to know there's somebody there, even if he's a drag.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.